start it. Okay, in the first part, I briefly mentioned to you the, the role of the MHC complex and the T cell receptor and how they play an important role in the, in the development of the immune response. And the next lecture, or this lecture, I'm going to go into some detail about the structure and the function of both the MHC molecules and the T cell receptor. Let's see here. So as a bit of history, um, the discovery of the MHC molecule came through or came by due to the fact that people recognized that if you transplanted an organ from one individual to another, in many cases, that organ would be rejected. And the big question was, how did this come about? Why would an organ be rejected? And using transgenic mice, these are mice that one, one strain is exactly the same and a separate strain, which is, which is different. But using these two different strains, they were able to discover that the reason for the rejection of these different organs was due to a particular molecule known as the MHC molecule. What they also recognized is that these molecules played a, a very important role in your ability to develop an immune response. And what I mean by this is that if you were to take a particular antigen and inject it into one strain of mouse, you may see a very strong immune response to that antigen. However, if you, if you injected that very same antigen into a different strain, so this mouse has a different MHC molecule, that ma mouse may have an entirely different response or no response at all. So what they realized is that the MHC molecule not only played a role in the rejection of transplants, but also played a very important role in your ability to respond to specific antigens. So some people can respond to a particular antigen better than others, and that is primarily due to the expression of different, MH different MHC molecules. And what they quickly found out is that these MHC molecules are highly poly polymorphic. It means that there are a number of different types of MHC molecules, or, or the MHC between people are, can, can vary greatly and there are a number of different MHC class molecules. And I'll explain that in a little bit more detail later. And they found out that the major role of the MHC molecules was to bind peptides and then present those to T cells. But the most important, or the important role of the MHC is the ability to bind to peptides and then present that to the T cells. And again, this is the structure was determined by uh, three-dimensional structure, uh, was determined by X-ray crystallography, and that's not really important for this lecture. So as I mentioned before, uh, MHC class I molecules are expressed by all cells, all nucleated cells in your body. So if you look down the line here, looking at the cells of the immune system, all cells of the immune system, for example, express class I MHC. Other non-related cells, such as brain cells, kidney cells, hepatocytes, all of these also express class one MHC. And that's the way that the, the, the immune system is, is able to recognize cell from non-cell. So if you look at the MHC class two molecule, this is only expressed by very select cells in the immune system. And again, these are primarily the antigen presenting cells. So let's, let's start by looking at the structure of the MHC class one molecule. It is a, uh, basically it's made up of two chains. You have the alpha chain, which has three subunits, alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three. It also has a beta subunit, beta chain, which is made up of one subunit. It has an intracellular or a transmembrane region, and that's linked into the cell, um, the cytoplasmic portion that has a, a cypher-phosphorylation. And the cypher-phosphorylation can play a role in the ability uh, to transduce a signal, but we won't really go into that in too much detail. Some of the important parts of this cell are, of this, of this molecule, are found between the, the, 
the alpha-1 and the alpha-2 chains. And this is the site where the peptide is found. And this is also the site where you see a lot of the polymorphisms. So this is the, the site that's different among various MHC molecules. So again, there's two polypeptide chains. There's a long alpha chain that's composed of three subunits. And there's also a short chain, the beta-2 chain. There's four regions. There's the peptide binding region that is formed by the alpha-1 and the alpha-2 domains. So again, this is where the peptide would sit, the antigen would sit. The alpha-3 domain is a immunoglobulin-like region, and this is highly conserved, so you don't see a lot of polymorphism, polymorphisms in this region. Importantly, this is also, with the MHC class 1 molecule, this is a site to which the CD8 molecule binds. The CD8 is expressed by T cells, and it binds to this portion. There's a transmembrane region that is a stretch of, of hydrophobic amino acids. And then finally, there's a cytoplasmic region, which contains a site for phosphorylation. And again, so here's a picture. Importantly, this region right here, although it's, it's, it's labeled allogenic site, this is the site in which the peptide binds. And also, this is the site of the, high, the polymorphisms. So if we look at the, the binding site for the, the antigen, it forms a groove. So the antigen is able to sit into this groove. And again, it's, it's formed by two alpha helices that form the walls. And it, then it's also uh, anchored by the beta, eight beta pleated, sheet, pleated sheets which form the floor. And as I mentioned before, this is the site we see most of the polymorphisms. Site lining that groove where the antigen binds is a site where you see most of the polymorphisms. And then again, this, plays, this will play a very important role because these polymorphisms that decide, or the makeup of that groove decide which antigen can bind and which antigen can be presented. So the more polymorphisms mean the more types of antigens that can be presented. And the more antigens that can be presented <laughs> gives us a better chance of responding to a particular pathogen. What they found out is that in the MHC molecule, the peptide binding group can bind peptides of eight to 10 amino acids. So anything longer or anything smaller cannot be efficiently bound by the MHC molecule. And pretty much except for the, the anchor site, these 8 to 10 amino acids can be any amino acids. But importantly, the anchor site requires a speci very specific amino acid. So say, for example, in this 8 to 10 amino acids, um, the third is a valine. And this anchor site requires a valine and a third amino, amino acid. That valine can be bound. I mean, that peptide can be bound. However, if there's any other amino acid there, that particular MHC molecule will not bind to that peptide. So given the fact that, say, for example, there's one required anchor site, you can, you can imagine how many different combinations of peptides can be bound. So the other remaining nine can be anything, any combination. So each MHC molecule can bind many different antigens as long as it meets minimum, the minimum requirements of having the, the right amino acid in the anchor site. Now, in the human MHC class 1 molecule, there are six different isotypes. There's HLA, B, C, E, F, and G. I don't know what happens to D, but these are the six. If you look at, if you classify these by polymorphisms, what you see is the HLA, B, and C. These are the most highly polymorphic MHC class 1 molecules. And importantly, these are the ones that are primarily responsible for the presentation of peptides to the MHC, to the T cells. HLA, E, and G, they don't play as big of a role in presenting antigen to the CD8 T 
cells. Therefore, uh, you would expect to see how then to be as highly polymorphic. These actually play a, a more of an important role in the interaction with NK cells. The HLAF, it's a monomorphic. So there's only one type of this MHC molecule has been identified. And the function of this really is not, not well known. And interestingly, this resides primarily in the cytoplasm. The point here is that the three MHC class one molecules that play the biggest role in presenting the antigens are also the most highly polymorphic. And by having the most polymorphisms in, in the population, that allows for the pre presentation of a number of additional antigens. Now, although there are a number of different forms of these different MHC class molecules, each person only expresses one different type, one um, isotype of these, or isoform of these. So this is just basically reiterating the other fact, the fact that the portion of the MHC molecule that's the most highly polymorphic is found in the MHC binding group. So when they did an analysis of the amino acid composition of the different MHC molecules, what they found is that the most differences were found in the alpha-1 and the alpha-2 regions. And again, this is the region where the, MH, where the peptide binds, or this is the region that forms the peptide, peptide binding group. If you look at the alpha-3 region, which is the immunoglobulin-like region, or the conserved region, you see very few differences here. I'm going to beat this into you. Again, the major polymorphic reason, the region with the most polymorphisms, again, is in the peptide binding group, shown here. And that's formed by the alpha-1 and the alpha-2 subunit. Again, if you look at the number of different allotypes found in the human population, it makes you class 1, um, HLA-A, is 218, B, 439, and C, 96. The point here, again, is that the A, B, and C, these are the ones that are involved in the pre presentation of the antigens. Again, so you expect these to be the most high polymorphic. Move on to the class 2 MHC. This is slightly different looking. Again, it's made of, of two chains. Um, there's an alpha-1 and alpha-2, an alpha chain and a beta chain. And each one of these has two subunits. So as opposed to the MHC class 1, which had two chains, the alpha had three and the beta had one. Here you have two chains. Both the alpha and the beta have two subunits. And the different regions, the, MHC, the peptide binding group is found between the alpha-1 and the beta-1. So it would be up here. The alpha-2 and the beta-2 are the conserved regions. And the beta-2 is where the, the CD4 will bind. You have a transmembrane region again, and then you have a cytoplasmic region. So very similar in the overall composition, just a little bit structurally different when, when it comes to the composition of the alpha and the beta chains. So again, summary of what we just discussed. There are two polypeptide chains, the alpha and the beta. These are roughly equal length. There's four regions again. There's the peptide binding group. This is formed by the alpha-1 and beta-1 domain. And again, as you would expect, this is the site of the most polymorphisms. So this is, the, this is where the different MHC class 1 molecules differ. There is an immunoglobulin-like region. So this is a conserved region. And the beta-2 is a site to which CD4 on the T cell binds. The CD4 and the CD8 molecule, CD8 on the, the, T, the cytotoxic T cells, these act to enhance the binding between the two cells. It's a transmembrane region. Again, it's a stretch of hydrophobic amino acids. And again, there's a cytoplasmic region. This contains a cytophosphorylation and binding sites to the size of 
cytoskeletal elements. We go through it quickly one more time. And importantly, what you should remember is that the peptide binding group is formed between the alpha-1 and the beta-1 subunits. CD4 binds to the beta-2 subunit. And the site for the polymorphisms is found in the peptide binding group. And again, just like with MHC class 1 molecule, they did the analysis of the, of the amino acid compositions of a population of uh, different uh, MHC class 2 molecules. And what they found is that most of the polymorphisms could be found in the beta, the beta 1 region. So most of the MHC class molecules were identical, except for in the beta 1 region. And again, this is the region of the MHC class 2 molecule that binds the peptide. Turns out it's not as, as, as uh, polymorphic as the beta-1 in humans. So when it comes to the polymorphisms, there are a number of different um, isotypes for the MHC class II molecule. There is the uh, HLA, DM, DO, DP, DQ, and DR. And what I'll tell you is that three of these, so the DP, which are these two, the DQ, and the DR. Um, so if you look at the different classes, DM, DO, DP, DQ, or DR as a class, which one of these three do you think are involved in the presentation of the antigen? I'll tell you that there are three. Two are not involved, and three are. Yeah, DR, DP, and DQ. Again, these are the ones that have the highest amount of polymorphisms. Turns out the DM and the DO play a role in the uh, loading of the peptide onto the class two MHC, and we'll discuss that a little bit later. But again, the ones that are most highly polymorphic are the ones involved in binding of the peptide. <coughs> so now we're going to compare and contrast a little bit of the between the class one and the class two MHC. And it turns out they're very similar. Both have a peptide binding group. So that's the hallmark of these MHC class molecules is that they're able to bind peptide and present it to T cells. Both are formed by two alpha helices and the floor is made up of eight beta pleated sheets. So they're very similar. One difference is that uh, the MHC class one molecule can bind an eight to 10 amino acid sequence the class two can bind slightly larger peptides. But what's important is that the requirement for binding of the peptide resides in the anchor sites. So both the class one and the class two molecules have anchor sites that require specific amino acids. So peptides that have that amino acid can bind in those regions. Once without it will not. Yeah, so the anchor site rule applies to both classes. An important aspect here is that the MHC molecules are membrane bound. And what that means is that in order to elicit an immune response from a T cell, there has to be cell to cell contact. It's not like the immunoglobulins that are secreted into the, are secreted from the cells. These are strictly membrane bound molecules. We'll discuss a little bit more about antigen processing and presentation in a subsequent lecture. But in general, what happens is that a peptide from the cytosol, so if a cell is infected with the virus or other cell peptides that are located in a cytosol, will be associated with the class 1 MHC. And this will be recognized by the cytotoxic T cells. In contrast to that, for the MHC class 2 molecules, the peptide is usually from a vesicle. And what happens is a lot of times these peptides are sampled from their microenvironment, taken up by APCs, and then presented with MHC class 2. And it turns out that there are some unique features about how this takes place, and we'll discuss that when we discuss antigen processing and presentation. Here's an important, a very important uh, point. Although there are a lot of polymorphisms between these MHC molecules, each individual can only express one type. So you have one HLAA, one HLAB, so on and so forth. Your HLAAs 
do not differ throughout your body. They're all the same. And in order to enlist an immune response, there has to be a peptide associated with the MHC class molecule. So if you have a foreign antigen circulating throughout your body and it's taken up by a cell, but it's not presented with the appropriate MHC molecule, no matter what it is, it won't be recognized by the T cell. So there has to be special arrangement between the MHC class one or class two molecule and the peptide. And there has to be a T cell that will recognize that in order to develop the immune response. And as I mentioned, there has to be a T cell. So you can have a peptide that is able to bind to a MHC molecule presented by the cell. But unless there is a T cell within your body that is able to recognize that antigen, there will be no immune response. The two levels of control are one, there has to be a peptide that is able to associate with a proper MHC molecule and it presented on the cell surface. The second level of control is there has to be a T cell that, is able to, that can recognize that MHC molecule in association with that peptide. And another point, point here is that each MHC molecule only has one binding site. However, different peptides can bind to that binding site. So if you have a, a, a cell that is expressing MHC class one molecules, it can express numerous different peptides on the same cell. So you can have, for example, cell peptides mixed in with viral peptides or numerous different peptides. Does that make sense? As long as they, they meet the requirement for the anchor site, any peptide combined to any MHC molecule. Sure. The anchor site has to be a very specific amino acid. And that's the only real requirement. It has to be the right size, and it has to have the amino acid in the right side, site for the anchor site, and it will bind. So it can be either a cell peptide or it can be a foreign peptide, as long as it has that. The, the, the antigen presenting cell that really doesn't have a way of differentiating between self and non self. That's up to the T cell. Important point also is that the MHC polymorphisms are determined in the germline. There are no recombination, there's no recombination mechanism. And that's important because when the T cell is developing, the way it develops in the thymus is it is told cells that can recognize MHC molecules are allowed to go on. And then ones that recognize cell peptides are deleted. And we'll discuss this a little bit more. But if you have changes in your, your MHC molecules, it'll, really, it'll screw up the ability of the T cells to recognize peptides. The, pe the T cells are programmed to recognize only the, MHC, the proper MHC molecules. So if you see any changes in those MHC molecules, the T cell will no longer be able to recognize it. And this is a bit of terminology. Because the MHC molecules can bind to many different peptides, Again, the only, only requirement is that it has the right anchor site. They're called degenerate. It means they combined self, non-self. Whoops. Lost control of this thing. Okay. Cytokines, we'll discuss cytokines later, what they are and how they act. But it is, it is known that cytokines can increase the level of MHC class 1, one molecules. And why might this be important? The cytokines are produced following an immune response. So if you have an infection, if you develop an immune response, a number of different cytokines are produced. If these cytokines can then upregulate the expression of MHC class 1 molecule, how might that help the immune, the immune system? Then? Yeah, basically what happens is by having more MHC class 1 molecules expressed by the cell, more peptides can be presented. If more peptides are presented, there's a better chance of presenting the uh, peptide against that pathogen. 
and more peptides that are presented against a pathogen, the higher the chance of developing the immune response. So it's a way of enhancing the immune response. Um, I think both can be upregulated, MHC class 1 and class 2. It really depends on the, um, the cytokine that's produced. It says here, basically what it's saying here is alleles of the MHC class 1 are co-dominant. That means each MHC gene product can be, can be expressed on the cell surface. So you can, mean, basically you can express HLA-A, HLA-B, and HLA-C. All of them can be expressed on the surface of the, of the of cell. So the question posed here is why is it important to have a high degree of polymorphism? What, does, what do we as a species gain from having multiple different types of MHC molecules? Any thoughts? What's that? Absolutely, yeah. What happens is by having more MHC type, more MHC, more alleles or more isoforms of the MHC molecules, each one of those may have a different requirement for binding the peptide. It, that will lead to more peptides that can be bound. So, for example, if you're infected with a particular virus and this virus is producing particular peptides and that your MHC molecules can't bind those peptides, they cannot, then you cannot produce an immune response. However, your neighbor may have a different MHC molecule that is able to bind that MHC peptide and then can form, the immune, can form an immune response. So it kind of, it protects or it, it's important for survival of the species. So if someone's infected with something they can't respond to, part of the population may be wiped out, but hopefully another part of the population will express a different MHC molecule that can bind the peptide and can elicit an immune response. All right, to switch gears a little bit, now we're going to talk a little bit about the, the partner of the MHC molecules, and that's the T-cell receptor. So in order, in order for immune response to happen, you have to have interaction between the T-cell receptor and the MHC molecule. Shown here is a, a simplified cartoon of what the T-cell receptor looks like. Again, it has two chains, an alpha and a beta chain. Importantly, there's a, a variable region and a constant region. So it's very similar to the MHC class MHC molecules. The variable region, or the most variable, or the hypervariable region, is found in the peptide binding group, or the part of the, the T cell receptor that recognizes the MHC molecule in association with the peptide. There is a transmembrane region, as well as the cytoplasmic tail. That is important for the transduction of the signal. Again, two polypeptide chains. There's an alpha and a beta chain. Uh, the roughly equal length. Both chains have a constant and a variable region. A difference between the alpha and the, and the beta is the alpha chain has a, a B region. The B, I'm sorry, the B region has a, a J joining segment. The beta has a J and a D segment. And this leads to the increased diversity of the T cell receptors. Shown here is a cartoon of the generation of a T cell receptor. You start with the germline. Top here is looking at the alpha chain. You start with the germline DNA. You get recombination in the rearranged DNA. So you take one of the variable regions of about 70, 80 choices, take one of the J regions from about 60 choices, and then the constant region. That forms the alpha chain. If you look at the beta chain, you have the B region, so you take one of the 52, a D, and a J, and that forms the beta. So shown here is the end product. And what you notice is that this area right here is where you have the most. This is called the hypervariable region. Now, there are diseases that will develop. I think Dr. Mayer talked about this a little bit. If you have a deficiency in the enzymes, that lead to this recombination. And these are in the uh, RAG genes. And what you can develop is a SCID, which stands for severe combined immune deficient. These patients don't have T cell receptors. 
they also don't have, they don't produce antibodies, so they don't have functional T or B cells. Because these enzymes are very important in both uh, development, T cells and B cells. Shown here is a patient with skid, and this is just a simple um, yeast infection that's causing this problem, the skid. And another disease that can develop is called Omen syndrome. And this is shown here, it's, awfully, it's usually fatal. And this is a, a, a rash that's developing on this face of this child. After waking you up a little bit and getting your stomachs churning a little bit, we'll continue on with the structure of the T-cell receptor. Um, again, the hypervariable region of the T-cell receptor, that contrib contributes to the diversity. That is where you see the differences between the T-cell receptors. And as we discussed, the T-cell receptor recognizes the MHC molecule in association with a peptide. So it has to be a self-MHC molecule and has to be a, a very specific peptide. And that is confirmation that it recognizes. If you have a, a different MHC or a different peptide, the T-cell receptor won't recognize it. I can really talk much about this, but I mentioned to you, showing you the T-cell receptor, I showed you the alpha-beta T-cell receptors. There's also a gamma-delta, but we really won't discuss that. And here's another a simple cartoon. Again, there's two chains, an alpha and a beta, and each has two subunits. The variable regions found, um, you have a variable region and a constant region, transmembrane region and a cytoplasmic portion. Again, this is the area that binds the MHC molecule in association with a peptide, and this is where you see the polymorphism, the, vari the variabilities. So, by looking at, at that, you, can, you notice that there are a lot of similarities between the generation of the T cell receptor and the generation of a B cell immunoglobulin. And what we're going to do here is just compare the two. So, when you look at the immunoglobulin, if you look at the VDG, VDG, VDG segments, both the T cell receptor and the immunoglobulin have. BDJ recombinations or have BDJ segments. So here they're very similar. Both have BDJ re rearrangements. The var variable pairs will form the engine recognition site. That's the same for both. Somatic hyper hypermutation. So with the immunoglobulins, you have somatic hypermutation, whereas the T cell receptor, you do not. And this is important because T cell receptors are very, very critical in recognizing cell from non cell. So if you have mutation in, if you have uh, somatic hypermutation, after being instructed how to recognize cell versus non cell, if they then change their T cell receptor, it may lead to a situation where that T cell receptor is now able to recognize cell peptides. And that will lead to autoimmunity. If both the immunoglobulin and the T cell receptor have transmembrane forms, the difference is the immunoglobulins can be secreted where the T cell receptors cannot. So in order to get a re response from a T cell, there has to be cell-to-cell -cell contact. Another important difference is that, as Dr. Mayer discussed, that the immunoglobulins have different isotypes, and these isotypes can dictate what type of effector mechanism takes place. T cell receptor does not. There's only one form. One other difference is the valency. The, the immunoglobulins have two binding sites where the T cell receptor only has one. Now we're going to discuss in the last few minutes some of the accessory molecules, some of the other molecules that are important in the interaction between the MHC molecule and T-cell receptor. And these molecules play an important role in the ability to activate the T-cell. And one very important complex is the CD3 complex, and this is found on all T-cells. It's a group of four proteins, and again, it's associated with the T-cell receptor. It consists of an alpha, a delta, and two epsilons, and a zeta chain, two zeta chains. 
And all these proteins are invariant. That means they're exactly the same. You don't have different forms of these. And the function of the CD3 has two, uh, two functions. One, um, it's required to bring the T cell receptor to the surface. So the association of the CD3 with the T cell receptor is necessary for the T cell receptor to be expressed by the cells, by the T cells. It also plays a very important role. Which letter is this? Theta? Yeah. I had to look that up. So it also plays an important role in transducing the signal after the T cell receptor interacts with the immensity complex. That's shown here in a cartoon. So again, CD3 cells flanking the T cell receptor associated with T-cell receptor, and following recognition here, signal gets transduced through the T-cell receptor, and primarily through these data chains. And actually, T-cells can be activated simply by binding the CD3. So if you have an antibody that can bind CD3, that can actually bypass the necessity for the T-cell receptor. So there's some more accessory molecules involved in the cell-to-cell -cell interaction. It's shown here a bunch of different ones. We discussed CD4. Again, this is important for the interaction with the MHC class II molecule and the CD4 and the T cell receptor found on T helper cells. That binds to the beta-2 domain. There are also CD8. This is important in the interaction with the class 1 MHC. It binds to the alpha 3 domain. LFA is a, it's an adhesion molecule, basically. And the ones that are important for us are the LFA2, which binds to LFA3. And this is basically helps the, the two cells stick together. LFA1 plays a very similar role to the LFA2. It's important in the adhesion of the cells. So basically, once the T cell receptor and the MHC molecule bind, these kind of help to, to stabilize that interaction. And LFA stands for leukocyte function associated antigen. I can intercellular adhesion molecule. So this one is more, basically tells you what it does. It's an adhes it acts as an adhesive. Shown here are some of these, these molecules. Um, importantly, you see that CD8 helps in the interaction between the MHC class one molecule and the T cell receptor. This helps stabilize this interaction. Uh, so you can see a very similar situation with the interaction between the MHC class two molecule and a T helper cell with a CD4. An important part of these is that they're all invariant. That means they're all exactly the same. You don't see differences between different. It's not me. It's the battery. That's no, okay. Oh. Well. It's kind of like the Gong Show. If you don't like it.